Welcome, Window to China and the Xin Yu One One. You introduce yourself and tell us more. Certainly, um, the recent award is the Lucian Strike Award for the best translation from an Asian language into English, which is given by the American Literary Translators Association, or ALTA. This took place recently in Milwaukee, just a couple of weeks ago. What's it a book about? The book, which I can show you right here, mm -hmm. uh, is called Every Rock a Universe, mm -hmm. The Yellow Mountains and Chinese Travel Writing. Mm. The Yellow Mountains uh, are among the most beautiful mountains in China, and indeed in the world. They have a kind of stark, austere beauty which has inspired poets, painters for centuries. But the golden age of the, go of the Yellow Mountains was the late Ming to early Qing, and especially the Kangxi period, let's say 1662 to 1722. The Manchus invaded China, conquered China in 1644, establishing the Qing Dynasty, and many looked to the Yellow Mountains as a place that symbolized the purity, the essence of Chinese culture. And they would go there to live, many of them. Uh, the man who wrote the book, which I translate here, a book of travel essays about the Yellow Mountains, Wang Hongdu, lived there for 10 years in the middle of the Yellow Mountains with his younger brother. Uh, and it was very difficult to get there at that time. They were hoping to get back in touch with the essence, the pure essence of Chinese civilization at a time when the country had fallen into foreign hands, which for them was a very traumatic experience. So uh, I was introduced by a Chinese friend to this book. It's called Huangshan Ling Yao Lu, or Comprehending the Essentials of the Yellow Mountains. Uh, it is a collection of prose essays about the different peaks, waterfalls, rock formations, pine trees, each with a, its own individual name. Uh, so why is it called Yin Ke Song, right? Welcome to the guests, right? Yes, that's right, exactly. The single most important and famous pine tree. And there's one whole essay about the pine trees and how they grow almost miraculously out of what appears to be pure rock. There seems to be no soil for them to grow out of. Uh, the feeling that the mountain is somehow spiritual in nature. Buddhists went there, Taoists, and also Ru Jia, what we call Confucianists, uh, the ancestors of the great Confucian thinkers, Cheng Yi, Cheng Hao, the Cheng brothers of the 11th century, Zhu Xi of the 12th century, uh, were born in Anhui province. And so temples were built at this time in memory of them. The Yellow Mountains were seen as a place where there might be a revival of the San Jiao, all the three religions of China, Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism. But then the mountains inspired great painters and great poets as well. So uh, one of the things I wanted to do was see the Yellow Mountains. And in fact, uh, seeing the Yellow Mountains was the only item on my bucket list. <laughs> I know you I have been there. there. Yeah, I, I, saw went, the I went there in spring 2011, and now I can die content because wow. it really, it was wonderful. And most amazingly, I got to see the Yellow Mountains mm -hmm. in the company of the great photographic artist, Wang Wusheng, who has allowed me to use his magnificent photographs of the Yellow Mountains in this book. Uh, and I, I brought along a couple of these photos, which perhaps the people will be able to see during the program. Uh, he is a great artist, I think Wang Wusheng is one of the greatest living Chinese artists in any medium. Mm -hmm. And he has shown his photographs at one man shows in Tokyo, mm -hmm. New York, Vienna, uh, all around the world. They are breathtakingly beautiful. And it was he who accompanied me there. So I felt as if I was seeing the Yellow Mountains with one of the great painters 
of the Qing Dynasty, except he was contemporary and a photographer. Wow, now, you, so you study, since you study the paintings, the calligraphy, and the poetry, now it's a photograph. Yes, graphy. yes. Wow, and that's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm arguing, too, that when you come to an artist of the magnitude of Wang Wusheng, mm -hmm. he belongs in the great tradition of visual artists, painters, now photographers, mm -hmm. inspired by the great beauty of the Yellow Mountains. Mm -hmm. I know, I know. But how you come up to the idea to do the translation work? That was because, uh, well, I have been translating Chinese poetry my entire life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I fell in love with Chinese poetry when I was in my teens. 14, you love nothing 50, else, yes. just <laughs> the poetry. I would just sit around reading uh, Arthur Whaley's magnificent English translations of Chinese poetry by myself. Um, and uh, I learned Chinese so I could read the poetry in the original. That's what I wanted to do. And then I became interested in the Chinese painting and calligraphy as well. Mm -hmm. And finally, the way in which they all work together. The poetry, the painting, the calligraphy, called in Chinese san the three perfect, the three perfections, the three perfect arts, completely uh, unified together. That particularly interests me. When I read this book, it's written in prose, but I felt that the prose was so beautiful, it was like poetry. It was like prose poetry, if you will. And I, I somehow felt that I had to translate it. Also, an associate of mine, Joseph Zhang, who was uh, at that time with the Sackler Museum of Asian Art here in Washington, D.C., was curating a show about paintings inspired by the Yellow Mountains. He asked me to do translations of some of the book, and I did, and they were shown in the exhibition, along with the paintings and also Wang Wusheng's photographs up on the wall. I fell in love with the book and I said, I have to translate the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So, and it was an experiment because I've never done prose before, at least not such extensive prose. And translating prose is a different thing from translating poetry. Uh, and for me, in some ways, it's more difficult. Um, my attitude toward literary translation, in fact, is that it is not merely a tool to help students or other scholars get closer to the original, it becomes a work of art in itself. Uh, and that is why many American poets in the 19th century, European poets, if you open their collected writings, they always will have a section of translations from Greek, Latin, Italian, German, Portuguese, various different languages, and they would consider these translations to be part of their oeuvre, of their complete work along with their original poems. That's the attitude I take. The, the goal that I set is very high. Mm. So I decided to give it a try. Mm. I can read you a section if yeah, you would please. like to hear it, mm -hmm. and, and then you can get some idea of what I'm talking about. One of the famous things about the Yellow Mountains is the so-called Huanghai, the Yellow Ocean, meaning the cloud formations that appear when you're very high up, they come up from below. And the, the people of the time believed that these clouds came out of caves in the mountains and at the end of the day returned to the same cave. Every cloud knew exactly what its address was. That's my cave. Go in at the end of the day. So the, sh the sheer beauty of the cloud formations is described in this way by Wang Hongdu. This is his book, which is written in 1696 but not published until 1775. He says, the clouds go along with the winds, sweeping and burgeoning above and below, until there is a great divide formed with heaven's vault, above all a perfect blue, while below, in the midst of the cottony forms, beams of sunlight flicker and penetrate and the forms of the peaks following these sometimes peak out and sometimes are again swallowed up. 
while purplish, bluish, greenish forms produce thousands and thousands of aureoles and thousands and thousands of types of scintillating light. And that is why everything beyond the mountains is one vast panorama of voidness, as even as the surface of a mirror. While within the mountains, it is as if thousands of skeins of silk are twisting and turning, floating and dangling among the crevices of all the peaks. This goes on and on and on. Wow. Now, in the original, at any rate, this is some of the most beautiful prose, I think, in the Chinese language, in that I attempted to capture it in English, and that's why I was so delighted when this book won the Alta Award, because this is not an association of sinologists it's an association of people who are dedicated to the finest possible literary translation from any language, you know, into English. Window to China and Xin Yuan Wan has reached out to the hundreds of Chinese community, Asian community, and American community on performance, interview in education, politics, culture, etc. It's a link for all the communities. Xin Yu and Judy Wu, the publisher AC Business are making joint efforts to promote the program on Newspaper Weekly. Window to China and C11 is a 30 minutes long English program. It will be available on YouTube, Facebook, Google+, AC Business News by keywords Window to China and C11. Hello, Ni Hao. Welcome to Window to China. Come and join us as we explore China's people and their culture. We will go to many places in China, from the Himalayan mountains in Tibet, to the Yangtze and Yellow River gorges, all the way to the modern cities of Shanghai and Guangzhou on the coast. We will visit wild areas, small villages, historic temples, and the crowds in big cities with millions of people. China is a big country with many cultures to visit and learn about. You can visit us at www.warnerinternationalinc.org to tell us what you think about our show and find out where we will be visiting the next time. We have so much to see, so come with me and look into another window to China. When you're reading this book, I just put myself into it. I'll just like a Zhishen Yu Cishan Zhong, as I can imagine. The, yeah. Club the ocean in the mountains and different all kinds of trees and then they are they have their own life like ours life. Right. So I have read several um, your book and your translation. I think um, must be um, the simple just translation. I would like to say uh, the the poem written by Yang Wanli. So what is the poetry? He said. If you say it is simple, a matter of words, I will say a good poet gets rid of words. If you say it is simple, a matter of meaning, I will say a good poet gets rid of meaning. But you ask, without the words, without the meaning, what is the poetry? Then I replied, get rid of words and get rid of meaning. There's still poetry. <laughs> what about you? What do you think it's poetry I, is? I agree completely. <laughs> yeah, I can, and to quote another poet of the Song Dynasty uh, a century earlier than Yang Wanli, who was 12th century, Mei Yao Chen, Mei Sheng Yu, mm -hmm. from the 11th century, he says, Yi zai yan zhi wai. The, the meaning or the feeling, yi, mm -hmm. The meaning or the feeling lies beyond the words. Mm -hmm. right? The words are used to capture the meaning, but then there's something that goes beyond them. Mm -hmm. Poetry is not limited to language. Mm -hmm. uh, and for that matter, painting in Chinese painting theory is not limited to the outer forms, lines, brush strokes, and colors. There's something beyond, something spiritual, if you will. Mm. Mm. I know that's such a hard work, how you can make that high level. Mm. I mean, some of the poetry is unknown writers have never someone approach it to do the translation. Yes. How, why you approach that way? 
Well, to begin with, when I started doing translations of uh, Chinese poetry, I knew immediately that what I did not want to do was simply do new translations of poets who had already been translated very well. Bo Jui or Bai Jui, for example, Arthur Whaley had already translated him so well that it was such a perfect fit. Uh, I have, in fact, translated individual poems by him, but I would not want to put out a whole book of translations of, uh, of Bai Jui. Uh, rather, I was excited by the, by the idea of exploration. Uh, I, I loved Sherlock Holmes when I was in my teens, and I wanted to be the Sherlock Holmes of Chinese poetry. That is to say, find the poets who are really great. They have to be really great, but they are not known today. Some of them not even that well known in China. Uh, right now at George Washington University, for example, I have a course on Chinese literature with the students of 50 percent Chinese from mainland China. And I asked them, have you ever heard of Wang Hongdu? Never heard of him. Had no idea who he was. I agree. <laughs> and, 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 and yet he is so wonderful. That's what I find exciting, to put someone on the map. So I have published the first book in English or in some cases in any Western language on certain poets. I see you have some of them here. The book on Mei Yao Chen was the first on him in English. The book on Yang Wan Li was the first on him uh, in English and indeed in any Western language. And then this book over here, Wu Li was already famous as a painter, but his poetry had never been studied. So this is the first book on Wu Li as a poet again, in any Western language. So this is the kind of thing that I really like to do. And as you pointed out, it, it's, it's even particularly difficult to do this type of work, because the famous poets, when you open up a collection of their writings, you will find uh, commentaries on them by all the scholars of the past. We must have 15 or more different editions of Du Fu, for example, the great Tang poet. And, you, and one interesting thing that you find when you look into them is that the commentators, the scholars who are writing about the poetry, they often disagree with each other about the actual meaning of something, or they will disagree about what the poet is really trying to convey. For example, is he being straightforward or is he being ironic? Or the equally reputable, knowledgeable scholars disagreeing about these things. When you look up the poetry of somebody like Wang Hung Du, and by the way, when I was in China, I discovered some lost poetry of his, completely unknown, even to Chinese scholars. There are no commentaries, because it's unknown, see? So I, the translator, have to become the research scholar first. I have to do the background research. He has a series of poems in which he took his family and they ran away into the Yellow Mountains to escape an uprising by a group of rebels. Uh, and I had to do some research to find out who were these rebels. Were they Manchus? Were they anti-Manchus? Were they government troops rising in rebellion against the authorities? All of these things were going on. And I was able to find the precise rebellion, where it started, how it moved into the Yellow Mountains region, to put the whole thing in context, it was hours, days of research before I could even start translating. Yeah, that's yeah. always connect the history, geography, it's essential. The, yeah, it's the thought at that time, something right. like that. I mean, it's amazing things you have done that kind of work. but. Uh, I'm curious myself, that's uh, 2,000 years ago, so you have done uh, great works, but who can approve it? Window to China and Xin Yuan Wan has reached out to the hundreds of Chinese community, Asian community, and American community on performance, interviewing education, politics, culture, etc. 
It's a link for all the communities. See you and Judy Wu, the publisher AC Business, are making joint efforts to promote the program on Newspaper Weekly. Window to China and C11 is a 30 minutes long English program. It will be available on YouTube, Facebook, Google Plus, AC Business News by keywords Window to China and C11. Hello, Ni Hao. Welcome to Window to China. Come and join us as we explore China's people and their culture. We will go to many places in China, from the Himalayan mountains in Tibet, to the Yangtze and Yellow River gorges, all the way to the modern cities of Shanghai and Guangzhou on the coast. We will visit wild areas, small villages, historic temples, and the crowds in big cities with millions of people. China is a big country with many cultures to visit and learn about. You can visit us at www.warnerinternationalinc.org to tell us what you think about our show and find out where we will be visiting the next time. We have so much to see, so come with me and look into another window to China. There are, of course, scholars of Chinese literature uh, throughout the world today. The study of Chinese literature has become an international mm -hmm. enterprise. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy to say that the scholars of China itself are back in the game after a long period of time when they were out of the game because of the so-called Wenhua Da Guoming, mm -hmm. the Cultural Revolution, 1966 to 76. But even more broadly, uh, almost from 1949, when the Communist, power came to, uh, Communist Party came to power, uh, all the way up to the end of the 1970s, it was almost impossible for Chinese scholars in China to do real scholarship on the Chinese classics. Anything that they did had to be done from uh, an extremely rigid Marxist point of view. That is, everything was interpreted in terms of class conflict. Uh, and when you take such an approach, you cannot possibly understand the writings of poets who were writing in a period of time when Marxism was not one of the accepted ideologies. They had other ideas in mind. And that's what I try to do, of course, and what the, 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 the scholar is supposed to do, is to get into the, the mindset the way of seeing, the way of feeling of the writers themselves, of their period, not ours. Mm -hmm. The idea is not to read our period into them, but to learn from them. And in fact, I agree with C.S. Lewis when he says, we are not so much the judges of the past as we are judged by it. It sets standards for us. So today, However, starting in the 80s, 90s, right up to the present, the scholarship in China has made a huge comeback. So there are scholars in China itself, in Taiwan, as there have been all along. The Japanese scholars, the greatest of them was Yoshikawa Kojiro, who died some years ago. His disciples are still teaching. And, and then in the United States and Canada and Europe, there are scholars of Chinese poetry, literature, art, who can be counted on to take a publication such as this, review it, uh, and sometimes I will consult with these people before I publish. Mm -hmm. and, and I will, sometimes I will come across problems which they too cannot solve. When I was working on this, uh, the, the Wu Li book, there was one poem in here that had a line in it that I simply couldn't figure out at all. Um, and so I contacted uh, Father Albert Chan, a Chinese Jesuit priest and scholar at the uh, then City University of San Francisco, who was a great authority on Wu Li. Um, and I put the line before him and asked for, for his help. I said, well, Ching Jiao. You know, please teach me. And he said, weeks go by, and he writes back to me, I can't figure it out either. <laughs> so in the book, I just left it blank, and I wrote 
the meaning of this line in a footnote. The meaning of this line is yet to be determined. The editor didn't like that at all. He said, no, why, why don't you just guess what it means? And I said, no, neither I nor Albert Chan, who knows much more than I know, were able to figure this out. That means nobody can, and we're going to just leave it blank for now. Maybe some student will read it and we'll figure it out. Yeah, true yourself and then true to the history. To Precisely. The but scholarship is always an ongoing endeavor. Just this stuff was written a long time ago. That doesn't mean that the study of it is finished. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it, for, for one thing, it's still alive. It can still move people today, mm -hmm. as you were saying before, and you are the perfect reader, mm -hmm. you know, judging from your reaction to this. But also, it means that more work needs to be done. Jiangzhu, Mu Chao, Chu Luo, Feng Lin, Shuang Yi, Hun Xi, Yi Zhang, Chai Men, Qu Ji, Huai Ren, Shan Se, Yi Wei. Do you have any uh, uh, next project? Are you working on that? Yes, I uh, recently I have been doing more and more work uh, that really is in the art history field. And I've been contributing to the catalogs of a series of exhibitions of Chinese calligraphy uh, and Chinese painting. Um, and at the moment, I am preparing uh, to do the same for what will be a major uh, Chinese painting exhibition in the year tw uh, 2016, 2016. It'll be uh, in California, but uh, I, I'm not supposed to go beyond that at this point. Mm -hmm. I will invite you again, 2016. Thank yeah. you for joining us, and then uh, we will wrap up. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Window to China and the Xin Yuan Wang has reached out to the hundreds of Chinese community, Asian community, and American community on performance, interview in education, politics, culture, etc. It's a link for all the communities. Xin Yu and Judy Wu, the publisher AC Business, are making joint efforts to promote the program on Newspaper Weekly. Window to China and C11 is a 30 minutes long English program. It will be available on YouTube, Facebook, Google Plus, AC Business News by keywords Window to China and C11. Window to China and C11 has reached out to the hundreds of Chinese community, Asian community, and American community on performance, interview in education, politics, culture, etc. It's a link for all the communities. See you and Judy Wu, the publisher AC Business, are making joint efforts to promote the program on Newspaper Weekly. Window to China and C11 is a 30 minutes long English program. It will be available on YouTube, Facebook, Google Plus, AC Business News by keywords Window to China and C11.